प्राणियों की हालत तो ये है वो तो आपकी संख्या से ही पता चलता है कि भारतीय सभ्यता को लेकर के आपका ज्ञान और आपकी जागरूकता आपकी तो ठीक है आप यहाँ बैठे हो जो बाहर सड़कों पर टहल रहे हैं वो कितने भ्रांत हैं कितने कम जागरूक हैं और भारत के बारे में कोई जानकारी ही नहीं है न भारतीय सभ्यता के बारे में न संस्कृति के बारे में और जानकारी नहीं होना तो चलो ठीक है ये बेचैनी भी नहीं है उनके वर्ग के भीतर वो जानते नहीं और क्या उनसे छूट रहा है और जो छूट रहा है वो कितना महंगा पड़ने वाला है वो उनको इसका भी कोई इल्हाम नहीं है कोई आइडिया नहीं है तो खैर उनका हिसाब तो वक्त करेगा और इसके पहले कि मैं दो शब्द और बोलूँ और मुख्य वक्ता को बुलाऊ में अभिनंदन करना चाहता हूँ प्रोफेसर ऋषभदेव शर्मा साहब का जो पूर्व अध्यक्ष हैं हिंदी विभाग के दक्षिण भारत हिंदी प्रचार सभा हैदराबाद में जो है और भाई डॉक्टर चेतन श्रीवास्तव जी जो एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हैं स्कूल ऑफ मैनेजमेंट में तो इन ये आपके निमंत्रण में तशरीफ आए हैं इनका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और आप याद रखिए शहर से आए हैं एक शहर से आए हैं और दूसरे को शहर के उस पार जाना है कम से कम तीन घंटे लगेंगे उनको यहाँ से जाने में इस वक्त जाने में तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आप तशरीफ लाए दोस्तों मैं इस विषय पर क्या ज़्यादा बात इतनी दूर से चल करके आया है वही बात करेगा आपसे आप उनको सुने समझें और उसके बाद फिर मैं मुखातिब हूँ आपसे कुछ बातें करने के लिए डॉक्टर राज वेदम साहब आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है आप तशीफ लाए आपके यूट्यूब पे बहुत सारे वीडियोस हैं आप बाद में देख नहीं सकते हैं बहुत सारे पेजेस हैं ब्लॉग्स हैं सृजन टॉक्स वगैरह आप उनको देख करके और आपके बारे में ध्यान समझ सकते हैं फिलहाल तो आप उनके व्याख्यान से लाभान्वित रहिए डॉक्टर राज साहब आपका स्वागत है Namaskar. I'm very, very happy. It's a privilege to come to University of Hyderabad. Address you all. Always happy to come to Hyderabad. The first time speaking at the university, so thank you very much for inviting me. So uh, today's talk is titled uh, uh, "Bharatiya Civilization: Deconstructing uh, Marxist and Other Interpretations." I'd like to show you that there are seven forces that are acting on Indian history. So I'll present uh, uh, my thesis. What the problem is? I'll try to show evidence that Indian history is being distorted. And from there on, I'll take the thesis and show all the implications of the distortions, and where does evidence take us? Because I come from an evidence-based analysis background, so we try to see where is the evidence for Indian history and where is it taking us. That, that's the goal of today's talk. So uh, before I start, my pronouns to all the gurus. Uh, we come from a tradition where we give our respects to our gurus. My pronouns to my gurus, and these are all you recognize. All the gurus of the talk who have had a great influence on me. You may not recognize the people here: P. V. Kane, Vartak, Dharampal, Srinidhanath Das Gupta, K. Munshi, Kota Venkata Chalam, who all written excellent works. And uh, I strongly urge you to note those names and download their works and uh, read it. And these are all the gurus of the current times who are producing enormous amounts of works in various areas. They have also had a great influence on me. And my pronouns to hundreds more unnamed teachers who uh, influence my uh, thinking. So today we live in a strange situation where Bharatiya identity is under severe attack. It is under severe attack. If you look at what is the identity of Bharat, we know that we had a very very ancient Vedic identity. If you ask how do you define this identity, what is it? Well. We garner information from the texts, knowledge, and the practices, and that defines who the Vedic people were, what their philosophy was, what their way of life was, what was the relationship to the cosmos, and things of this nature. We know that in this huge timeline of India, we came through a period of Islamic destruction and the suppression of the identity of Indians, which went on through the colonial distortions in 1700s. And today, a whole lot of vested interests and their distortions from eighteen hundreds to the present times, and finally, the Indian government also from nineteen forty-seven, which could have done better for Indian identity, but has not done much. So we are a process where our identity has been uh, uh, 
there's destructive forces on them, destructive forces on them, the center of everything is Hindu phobia, the fear of Hindus, the fear of Hindu practices, the fear of Hindu philosophy, the fear of Hindu ideas. These hatred and fear is what spurs most of the discourse in today's India. And we'll try to see evidence of some of these things. I'd like to give you very quickly a couple of exhibits. A news report came out in 2016 from Mizoram in a place called Vakshia that they found, along with the megalith culture, the ASI found a Vigraha of Ganapati over there. They found a Vigraha of Ganapati, and this news is reported in India today in uh, DNA and uh, various other places that they had made a startling discovery sculptures of Ganesha, Kalki, Makara, guarded by the Neolithic uh, Mehirs of the lost civilization. Immediately after that, the people of Mizoram went on a protest. And what was the protest? Here it was. No Hindu relics at Vamchia. ASI lies. Hello, Independent Republic of Mizoram. Hello, new Christian country, and so on. So the first reaction of the people was to reject their past in an effort to try and manufacture an identity for themselves that Mizoram is a clean country without any Hindu influences and things of this nature. So this is the response. And uh, uh, as a consequence today, that entire story from ASI has been removed. You will not find traces of it anywhere that uh, Ganesha Vigraha was found in uh, Mizoram. This is one, one exhibit. Another exhibit, we know that uh, uh, approximately in, uh, maybe in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, the, the CSIR lab called National Institute of Oceanography that sent a ship equipped with sonar to the Gulf of Cambay to map the ocean flow. And they found over there some very, very strange relics. It was reported in episodes in March 2003. They found a nine kilometer long feature 40 meters below the sea level. They found some artifacts dated to this time frame, 8,000 to 9,000 years before present in that particular place. The response of the UPA government at that point was immediately to stop the funding for the CSIR lab. They did not allow them to proceed with an underwater investigation. That was not in the charter, apparently. And instead, the money was poured into the study at Muziris. Muziris is a, a, a hypothetical port in southern India, in Kerala, in a place called Patana. And why that is important is that is the place where the alleged Thomas is supposed to have arrived in India. And so money was poured from ASI from there into the research at uh, Muziris. So once again, it's the same story, story, story of Dwaraka and Muziris. So today we have had to fight for this. Dr. Swami, for example, writes a PM and says, once again, let us do investigation over here. There is a lot of Hindu relics over here and can do research over there and nothing much is happening. Instead, money has been poured into Muziris and Patana and uh, Professor Vasant Shinde, so he has called out the research at Muziris as dubious. He makes very, very strong statements. He says dubious. He completely rejected the claims made by excavators and say some of them lack professional or academic expertise to carry out such an excavation. However, we see a familiar story here once again. There is an attempt to manufacture an identity. And that attempt is going on right under our noses in, uh, in, in Kerala by suppressing what the material evidence shows us and instead going and trying to find evidence for a narrative for which there is no material evidence. That's the sad part of what is going on. Exhibit 3 on identity division. Here is a textbook from Standard 7 used in Telangana, and uh, I reviewed these textbooks. I'm not singling out Telangana. This is there in every other state of the SCRT because they all get inspiration from NCRT textbooks. And over here, we found while reviewing it that there's a statement on Ghazni and how he came to India. So it says his targets were wealthy temples, and he carried away the wealth of those temples to create a splendid capital at Ghazna. So this is a reporting that your children are learning in the seventh standard regarding one of the greatest plunderers, infamous plunderers who came to India, murderers, and who came and took the wealth of Somna. It was handled with kid gloves, and this is the way that, uh, it was presented. And we made the correction and said, call it for what it is. Use a splendid glorifies invader. Use of the phrase wealthy temple has a negative connotation that somehow it is okay to plunder a wealthy temple. Just because it is okay, somehow it is okay to plunder it. And uh, instead, we made the recommendation that he raided North India almost many times, slandered, destroyed targets, and so on and so forth. Just one example of how textbooks are distorting the history of India. And this lady, we all know about her, Professor Audrey Trushke, who wrote about uh, Aurangzeb.
and these are all revisionist authors. And the bottom line is SCRT and CRT contain toxic content as far as children are concerned in what they're teaching to children. So the Indian identity today I'm claiming is that it is manufactured and kicked around by various vested interests. Everybody's got an interest over here, kicks around with identity. So today you see people over here with so-called religious identity, the wear of the sleeves. You find the so-called caste identity, the Aryan tribal identity, regional identity, language identity. And today a strange identity has emerged, one that is based on Hindophobia. Several forces are joining together, united by their hatred for the Hindu religion. And you see such an identity also coming uh, together. So each of these identities distorts and undermines the framework of unity of the people, and these are utterly spurious. So I'm saying that the failure to inculcate a national identity, this is due to the failure of positive narration of history. And because of that, we cannot connect to the past. We are all disconnected and rudderless. We are all deracinated people who have been removed from our context of our culture and civilization. There is not one person in this audience, or maybe in all of India, who can say proudly, I am an inheritor of that ancient civilization. We are unable to do that because we have lost our connections, we lost our cultural moorings. At various levels, we have been deracinated. So we have youngsters who today go around saying that I am a global citizen, don't bother me about all these things. I don't believe in identity. I don't know what that means for passport and visa and things like that, but they refer to themselves as global and world citizens. And there are people who say, don't, don't bug me, I work for Google or I work for Yahoo, that's my identity and I don't care about any of these things. The reason why they go about like this is because our texts and our media have shamed them into expressing positively who they are and what their identity is. Because of that, you see these strange expressions of their identity as global citizens and corporate and such. So today, uh, there are five forces allied against Indian history. So you have starting with the colonial perspectives, soon followed by the Eurocentric perspectives, then the Western interests uh, that have uh, got the bearing on this one, the left uh, liberal academic bias, and finally the Marxists. All of these people use history plus ideology to subvert your identity. That is what is going on today. At the center of everything is bigotry and hate against Hinduism and Hindus. And this is a common knowledge, although it's not expressed, it's not polite to talk about these things. But this is a university. University is a place where we examine ideas. And so I'm presenting to you these ideas. They might be controversial, but I'm presenting these ideas to you. <coughs> Why was Indian history distorted? Well, the early colonial historians were motivated by a desire to uphold the biblical chronology. They believed that God created the world in 4004 BC. Every educated Englishman in 1700s strongly believed this idea, belonging to the Anglican Church. So they came to India and they found the Puranic accounts of India going to enormous timelines. They could not understand where does Indian history begin, where does it end, and how is it related to the Western history. And they were interested in finding that out. So they looked at the, the Western accounts and they found Megasthenes as somebody who came to India and wrote Indica. And he seemed to have met something called Sandrakutus. And so they found that politically, Sandrakutus is close to the Puranic account, something called Chandragupta Maurya. And they said, aha, here's our anchor point. So Sandrakutus and Chandragupta Maurya. And so they, they said, that is the historical uh, anchor point. Unfortunately, in the Purana account, Chandragupta Maurya is about 1200 years earlier than 300 BCE. So that is the problem. So they started introducing distortions because of their desire to uphold biblical chronology. Because they also believe that God created the world 4004 BC. God destroyed the world in 3000 BC, Noah's flood. And Noah's ancestors were the ones, sorry, descendants were the ones who populated the whole world. And so they tried to fit even Indians into one of those categories and trying to see that. So they could not accept <coughs> India can have a history that is older than 3000 BC. So an entire industry of colonial historians came, whose only, it was fashionable in those times to say, I read the Sanskrit text and I updated it over here. This is the date I'm proposing for that. So they proposed young chronology for India. So the linguistic analysis was the second one. So ever since William Jones, he found the common commonality between Latin, Sanskrit, and Greek. They questioned how is it possible? How are the European languages? Why are they related to Sanskrit? So they believed that maybe they all had a common ancestor, ancestral language, and that ancestral language was called Proto-Indo-European. 
and they propose the homeland for the Central Asia between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. This is, that's the homeland. That gave rise to a Eurocentric narrative. Because of this, there had to be an Aryan invasion theory to India, because that's how the you know, Aryan was supposed to come to India. And as a consequence, the Dravidians are supreme people. Missionaries wanted to convert the southern Indians. The left liberal academia, they privilege alien sociological lenses to study Indian history and culture. All of Indian history is seen through the prism of maybe postmodernism, subaltern studies, feminism, and postcolonialism, and every other isms that you can think about. These are the lenses that are used to study every aspect of social interaction or anything in India. And it has given rise to a very bigoted way of looking at India. Everything is in the prism of oppressor, oppressed. Who was the oppressor? Who is the oppressed? Everything. Everything is reduced to that. There's no positive narration of history. There's no positive narration of social customs or anything. Everything has been reduced to these interactions at the base level as oppressor and oppressed. And that has given rise to enormous distortions in the way that we look at ourselves. Finally, the Marxist desire to subvert the Indic identity. Marxists always believe that change comes on the back of a revolution. And for them, the revolution in India is to destroy Hinduism. If Hinduism can be destroyed, they can inject a noxious uh, agenda. So they, they desire this one. And here is an example. He's a thought leader and a, a, a corporate leader. Recently, in Times of India, January 7, he came out with a statement that our culture is the reason we are not progressed. And he even said that this culture is part of India for the last 2,000 to 3,000 years. In other words, he took aim squarely at Hinduism and said it's because of Hinduism that we are backward, espousing the idea that Hinduism must be thrown out of progress. And this is the kind of thinking that is there even in corporate India in most youngsters today. Very, very unfortunate. But this is the kind of uh, leaders that we have. So I'm also claiming that a big force that happened in India was the ethnocide of the British uh, uh, did. The British, in addition to engineering widespread poverty in the country, they distorted the Indian history with false timelines. We talked about this. They also removed several of the original sources. Many of the original sources in Sanskrit don't are not in India anymore. They are in uh, Cambridge and universities all over uh, UK. They oversaw the creation of something called caste. Caste is not a word that is there in any of the Indian languages. However, they oversaw something called the creation of caste. The missionaries introduced atrocity literature because they were interested in the oppressor oppressed kind of dynamics. They wanted to show how evil Hinduism and its practices were. So they created enormous bodies of atrocity literature. They could go around giving various people and fueling all the conflicts that were there in the country, especially people like uh, Caldwell and Ellis and uh, so many other missionaries had done that. They manufactured this Dravidian identity and via conversions they introduced enormous conflict in the nation. They introduced the English Education Act in uh, 1825, suffocating Sanskrit as a reason and creating Anglo elites. These Anglo elites were removed from the context of the country and deracinated classes. And these are the people who have inherited India. End result is 200 plus years of ethnocide have been working on you, me, your father, your grandfather, and everybody to such a point that we have all become deracinated in various extents. That is the result of the ethnocide that they did. And unfortunately, the policies have continued unabated in independent India. We don't seem to have done anything to reclaim our identity. So that said, this is a graphic from Harikiran Vatlamaniji. So he points out the modern forces that are manufacturing the identity. He says the Western identity narrative through the evangelist pressures is operating on the government, academics, media, and NGOs, and the religious groups in India. So the government, through a process of discrimination, all of you know that the laws in India discriminated against the Hindus and uh, not against the minorities. Through a process of appeasement, where have we heard that before? They work on infringing the rights of the Hindus, and that's how their rights are infringed upon. Academics, media, and NGOs, they work through a process of distortion, appropriation of, uh, of the message of Hinduism so that they can distort it, and they work on an identity. They create an identity for you, which you can wear through the movies that they show, through everything else they show, a very negative portrayal that people are internalizing. Religious groups, they work through the idea of persecution, proselytization, and changing the demographics. All of them are working with Hindu phobia in mind, getting rid of Hindus. Once again, the same message comes again and again from various forums. 
So I approach this whole thing as an engineer saying, where is the evidence for all these variations? What can we do about it? So one has got to look for evidence and look for analytical approach to this. So we all use models in some sense or the others. If you're an academic working in some uh, analytical fields, the chances are you have a theory which you encode into a model, you put some inputs into this, get some outputs, you examine these things and you see whether it fits the real world, things like that. So I'm saying one must have a model-based approach. A good model accommodates all evidence coherently with little or no conflict. In the context of Indian history, we got boatloads of data, enormous amounts of data from archaeology, epigraphy, coins, literature, oral records, foreign travel records, uh, climate, astro <coughs> excuse me, astronomy, sciences, genetics, paleontology, so on. Many, many, many fields you have data coming in. And if somebody says, I know the model for Indian history, we need to see, do all these data points fit that model coherently? Do they explain the data coherently? If it doesn't explain, a red flag must go off. We are all in the university environment, right? We are all should be able to say, excuse me, there's something wrong with your model, or there's something wrong with your claims, there's something wrong with your theory, something wrong with your data, your sampling, your conclusions. Something is wrong because some of your data is not fitting the model. That is what we're trying to see analytically. So it turns out that today the dominant model on Indian history is something called the linguistic model. So this linguistic model, like I said, it's a search for the Proto-Indo-European ancestral language. And they say the homeland is in Central Asia. If you believe this model, the implication is there is an Aryan invasion theory in 1500 BC from Central Asia. And if you believe this, the result of this is Sanskrit, Hinduism is an Ipo, Dravidian is a big people. Today, a whole lot of people are talking about genetics, and they believe that genetics is an independent line of evidence. Unfortunately, it's not true. If, for example, I'm the judge in a murder case, and I got three witnesses, if I allow the witnesses to talk among themselves, they'll all converge to the same story. And I do not get three independent testimonies, right? We'll just get one independent testimony. Something similar is happening in genetics. Genetics is making use of constraints from linguistics. If linguistics says 1500 BC, there was an Aryan invasion theory, They'll say, oh, right, how many generations, maybe 500 generations we can depict here. That will provide the upper and lower bounds for the mathematical models of genetics so that when it converges, it will obey these constraints, if you understand what I mean. So because of that, this is evidence that is made to fit the linguistic model. It is not an independent line of evidence. That is the bottom line. There's a whole lot of evidence that does not fit the linguistic model, astronomy, archaeology, climate records, Oral and so on. So we will investigate some of these things. Now I want to take one by one these actors and try to show you some of the issues over here. Uh, William Jones and uh, uh, Max Muller, we already talked about what they said. Many people come and ask, so why is it that you bring religion into the perspective? Is it even relevant? Well, it turns out that these guys have said these things in several written records. William Jones said, either the first 11 chapters of Genesis are true or the whole fabric of our national religion is false. In this particular work, he said this. And he also said, I'm obliged to believe the sanctity of vulnerable books of Genesis in this work. Max Miller, I look upon creation given in Genesis as simply historical. And uh, this you can find in this particular work. And these are the guys who imposed young chronology on India in deference to the biblical model. And they discredited the Indian sources because they have got great antiquity. They said these are not reliable texts. It's not reliable because they seem to have timelines going back to God knows when. And said so that's not reliable. And they proposed recent linguistic dates for Sanskrit works. Here's one more of Max Miller I found recently. This is in a book, Life and Letters, uh, that's edited by his wife. So in 1866, he said, the Vedas are at the root of the religion. And to show them what that root is, I feel sure the only way of uprooting all that has sprung from it for the last 3,000 years. This is his own words. If some of us think Max Miller was such an altruistic man, he took such great pains to translate the Sanskrit text and leave English for us. We are indebted to this man. Well, it is not altruistic at all. By his own words, he was motivated to destroy Hinduism. And that is the reason why he did most of the works that he did. And his own writing brings it out. So rebutting the colonial ideology is trivial, right? Today we belong to the world of science and so on. Even if you believe or don't believe in the Big Bang model, we know that the universe is around 13.8 billion years old. It's not 4004 BC, but pretty old. We know of plate tectonics, that the continental plates are shifting around for millions.
tens of years, hundreds of millions of years is happening. Paleontology tells us there are dinosaur bones going back to 60 million years, 90 million years, and so on. All of these things clearly disprove the colonial model, very, very trivially in it. So uh, the next model to investigate is the linguistic model. So the linguistic model, initially the Europeans, Arthur William Jones said, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit related. They said, where is the homeland? Initially, they thought India was the homeland. That's how it started. They said, India is a homeland. Sanskrit is the mother of all languages. That's the beginning point of the research. However, two things happened. One is they discovered the Mitannis and the Hittites. These are people who lived approximately in northern Iraq and Turkey. That is the area that they lived in. And they found, to their surprise, that these people appeared to have spoken Sanskrit. They also found that the kings, the up to 40 king lists they found over there, who had Sanskritic names. One of the names was Tushrata, for example, very close to Dasharatha, Tushrata. And these kings had peace treaties with the Egyptian pharaohs. For example, the pharaoh called Imenhotep II, who lived in 1350 BCE. Tushrata had a peace treaty with him saying, in the name of Indra, in the name of Varuna, in the name of Ashwini twins, I promise not to attack you. These kind of peace treaties, right? That is what the, these uh, kings did along with them. So when they discovered them in the late 1800s, they asked, how is it that Sanskritic people landed up in Turkey and so on? So they proposed that maybe India is not the homeland. Maybe the homeland is somewhere in Central Asia. From Central Asia, one branch of people went that side and settled uh, uh, Europe and other places. Another branch came towards India in 1500 BC. That's the Aryan invasion theory. That's how this idea was born. And so they used linguistic analysis, timelines, Aryans had to be in India in 1500 BC. Then they discovered the Indus Valley civilization. So the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they found several uh, skeletons in Mohenjadaro in various streets of the soil, they went on saying, here is an example where Indra stands in the grave. Indra, they said, is Purandara. Purandara is the destroyer of forts. And they said, whole of Rig Veda is a military manual, and it shows a military kind of culture. And here is an example, we have skeletons in Harappa. It's an example that these people came, invaded, destroyed these uh, people, and they call them an Aryan invasion theory. That's how the invasion came about, using linguistics and archaeology as a main tools to propose this theory. In 2000s, today, it has become a migration. Nobody accepts invasion anymore. It's become a migration theory from the proto indo european homeland using linguistics, architecture, and genetics. And we are going to investigate some of these things. So the, what is PIE? PIE is a mythical hypothesized language. There is no record anybody, any culture, anywhere spoke this. There is no epigraphy. There is no written records. There is no descendants of people who spoke this language. However, academically, it was a reconstructed language. And through that, they said, through this ancestral language, you have Balto-Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic, Hellenic, Indo-Iranian, to Indic languages and so on. This is the proposed reconstruction using comparative method of linguistics. I thought I'll give you an example to give you a flavor for what they did. So this is a very familiar bullock cart. You see in every Indian village, it's very, very familiar. There's also the Mohenjadaro. You see this wheel Mohenjadaro is exactly the same. So if you have in your culture technology for a bullock cart, you must have words for the wheel, for the nave, for the hub, for the axle, for the yoke and other things. You must have words. You can't go to a technician and say, I want to make that thing you do that thing you do repair this thing you can't do that you must have words in that culture so I'd like to see what is the words in sanskrit latin greek hittite and tokarian for we the word is chakra in sanskrit rote and very close rotate in latin kuklos in greek for yoke it is yoga or lugam nave it is nabya or umbilicus axle is aksa or axis these are the kind of words in various languages now when the pie people try to reconstruct this they proposed that there was an ancestral language called PIE, which had a word called Queklo. Whenever you see star in the word, that star means it's not a real word. It's a reconstructed word, reconstructed in academia. So there's a word called Queklo that gave rise to Proto-Indo-Iranian language, a word called Kekro, which is also reconstructed. That gave rise to the Sanskrit word Chakra. So this is a proposed reconstruction from uh, PIE to this. The irony of this one, unfortunately, is that all of the data to reconstruct academically was found in Sanskrit. Sanskrit provided the data in the word list, in the grammar and everything else, using which they, they reconstructed rules of grammar to work backwards and proposals. For example, in Canada, I might say for milk, halo. 
in Telugu you might say pa, palu. In Tamil you might say pa. So pa became pa and so on. So, so it's a rule that will govern how that phoneme went from one, uh, it changed from one to the other. So they elaborately reconstructed all kinds of rules to go backwards by more and more rules that's allowed in this kind of thing. So I just want to show you the absurdity of PIE reconstruction using this particular example. So today there are two main thought leaders. This is Maria Kimbutas and Professor Colin Redfraw. She came to the Kurkana Steppe hypothesis. She said the language expansion happened in three waves between 4000 BC to 1500 BC. She said horse was domesticated in Central Asia and after they also invented iron, so they had superior weapons to bronze, bronze age weapons or brass and other such things and they had the horse and because of this they were able to colonize the world going wherever they wanted. That was her theory. It happened in three years. This professor was opposed to this thesis and he proposed that agriculture was invented in Turkey, Anatolia and the spread of agriculture to the whole world, that was the impetus for language transmission also. That was this idea, 6500 BC, but today a lot of people are favoring the Kulkan or the Steppe hypothesis and this is what that hypothesis is in a nutshell. So this one shows 3500 BCE between Caspian Sea and Black Sea, the Yamnaya culture and this is a, again this is not a story of civilization. Observe that we had Harappa, Pirana, Mega, Bimbetka, Lotha, Ledekal, a lot of activity happening in India. This is not a story of civilization. This is only the story of who are the Indo, so called Indo European people. Okay? So you had Egypt, Sumeria, Chinese culture, and so on. So by 2500 BC, the spread to the west becoming Corded Ware people, to the east, the Andernova people. By 1500 BC, we have there's a people called Bactria Margiana archaeological complex and they have entered into Sindh and Gujarat in India. This is the beginning of the Aryan invasion theory. By 500 BC, they are settled in Ganga plain and you see the appearance of a people called Dravidian. So this is the accepted Aryan invasion theory or migration theory today. So I'd like to now examine this and see, I question these things. This is the mainstream narrative of it. So on this side is what is there in the textbooks, in CRT textbooks probably what you're studying in the history department in this university and other places. It says that there was an Aryan invasion theory. However, I'll show you the evidence shows there's an out of India theory. They say Indic thought only impacted the East. For example, they say Indian thought impacted Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, all these countries. However, it did not step one foot outside Afghanistan to the West. That is what they say to preserve so-called purity of their thought from Hinduism in biblical lands. It is necessary to do that. I can show that an impact of the East and the West. They say Indic civilization is recent. After the so-called isolate of Harappa uh, disappeared, they say India went into a wasteland for more than a thousand years until Magadha's contact with the Greeks. So the Greeks, through Magadha, brought civilization to India. That is what the Marxist and other narrators would have us believe. So it's a recent civilization. However, I'll show that's an ancient civilization. They tell us that everything we know, whether it's mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, whatever have you, came from the Greeks or the Babylonians. They thought this. We were great students. We were never teachers of the world. However, we can show that it is Indian thought that seeded the Greeks and Babylonians. They say we are Aryans and Dravidians and tribal people. However, we'll show the identities are manufactured. They say Vedic culture is responsible for widespread poverty. We can show that invasions are responsible white poverty and I'd like to examine using astronomy, archaeology and genetics. So the first rebuttal to the linguistic model, I'm not going to go deep into this because there's no time to cover this whole thing. I just want to point out two thought leaders, Srikant Thalagiri and Nicholas Kazanas. Thalagiri has written two books, Rig Veda and the Early Indians, a recent book. So his central thesis is that the Rig Vedic books, there are 10 Mandalas over here. He says it's not written in order like book one, book two, book three. Instead, he says book 2, 3, 4, 6, 7 are older, 1, 5, 8, 9, 10 are later. He shows that the earlier books have knowledge to the east of the Saraswati, geography of the east of Saraswati, and the later books have got knowledge to the west of Saraswati, implying an east to west movement of the people rather than the west to east as the Aryan invasion plan. That is his thesis. He also points out the Vedic names of the Mitanis and Kesites and proposes certain things. So, he makes a case for the homeland of Proto-Indo-Europeans to be in Northwest India. He said if you locate the homeland in Northwest India, the theory falls into place perfectly. There's no problem. It is from India that these cultures went out. If you do that, then there's no problem with the linguistic model. 
if you place it in Central Asia, he found many, many, many counterexamples and he's uh, listed them in the books. The other expert is uh, Nicholas Kazinas. He wrote these two books. I recommend uh, reading them if you get the chance. He has got very, very strong statements. I'll just go to the bottom line. He says that linguist, comparative linguistics is a failed model, cannot predict consistently. He calls out the circular argument, absurdity of reconstructing PIE, using that as a basis of further analysis. And he says, in my view, all the mainstream academic publications subject of reconstructing PIE are utterly worthless. Very, very strong statements for an academic to make, but that is the, his belief system in this whole thing. So I'll just leave you with that particular rebuttal. I'd like to go now to the issue of the antiquity of the Indian people, because antiquity of the Indian people is not something that is easily discussed in the media and other places. What, what, what internal evidence do we have to talk about antiquity? Well, we can go to archaeology and paleontology to start with. And uh, uh, if you see the works of Shanti Papu, Shanti Papu's uh, uh, researcher has been working on this for long, and she shows in southern India artifacts from one million years ago. She examines the rock specimens, and she the species living at that particular period of time is probably the Homo erectus. Then there is a very curious case of the Narmada man. Narmada man is a skull that was found in Narmada Valley in 1982 by somebody called Arun Sunakya of the Geological Survey of India. What is peculiar about this one is it shows a cranial capacity of 1400 cubic centimeters, very close to the modern human beings. Whereas the other Homo erectus samples from China or Africa have got an average cranial capacity of 1000 cc. So the question comes, what was the specimen? Was it the Homo erectus, which is supposed to have become extinct 500,000 years ago? Or is this a Homo sapien? Homo sapiens are supposed to have come into India about 85,000 years ago. So the question is, what is the specimen? Then uh, uh, Shanti Popo again recently published a work showing that in Tamil Nadu, Asaram Patnam, she found several stone tools belonging to this time period, 350 to 180,000 years ago. And she talks about two kinds of tools. One kind of tool is a bulk tool. The bulk tool is you hold a huge stone in your hand, you throw it at your uh, animal or something like that. That's one kind of tool. It doesn't call for much intelligence. The second kind of tool is you take the uh, stone in one hand, with the other hand, you keep chipping away at it, make a sharp corner and so on and so forth, and specialize the tool. Some tools might be used for scraping the skin, right? To remove the flesh from the skin to make a cloth. Some might be used to make a javelin point, some for a spear some for an arrow and so on. So this kind of diversification of tools are precision tools are associated with homo sapiens. Larger cranial capacity must make them. She said all these were precision tools that she found in Tamil Nadu. Opening the question, who was making these tools in India 350,000 years ago if the homo erectus is supposed to have become extinct 500,000 years ago and if genetics tells us that modern man came into India from Africa 85,000 years ago, make these tools in India. So it opens up new questions. We don't have an answer for that still. Then 40,000 years ago, we have cave art all over India. If you go to Bimbetka or any other place, you find cave art. Even in Andhra Pradesh, Ketavaram and other places, you got all kinds of samples of cave art, rock art and so on. 10,000 years ago from Edekal, Birana, we got artifacts, archaeological artifacts. 8,000 years ago, I talked to you about underwater artifacts in Dwarka and what I call recent artifacts from 5,000 years comparatively for Harappa, Ganga Plain, Kiradi, Arikamedu, Patana. All over India in various time frames, the bottom line is we got artifacts that point out the antiquity of the Indian peoples. Then I'd like to show you material evidence from the internal evidence of the Indian text. The Indian text contains several instances to astronomy, which can be dated very, very precisely. And so I'd like to present to you some of that evidence and uh, before we go on. So the, I'm not going to go very deep because all my talks are talking about astronomy models, so please go there for further details. But I, here I'll just summarize and say that the Indian astronomical model was one of nakshatras and rashi. Don't go looking for a theorem and mathematics and trigonometry in early Indian texts and astronomy. You won't find that. The earliest Indian astronomical wisdom was encoded in stories. If you go to the Puranic stories, you'll find stories of astronomical bodies. If you have the key to unlock the wisdom, you know what your ancestors intended to convey to you. If you don't have the key to unlock that wisdom, it becomes a silly mythology. 
So today we have a propensity to dismiss all of these as silly myths because we have lost the intellectual capacity to unlock these stories. One such story is Chandra married the 27 daughters of King Daksha and every day he visited one of his wives. If we have a key to unlock that story, we understand what our ancestors wanted to tell us. Otherwise, we could stand back and say, our ancestors are stupid, superstitious people. What do you mean Chandra was not a man and there's a question of marrying 27 wives, come on. <laughs> no problem over here. Well, what happens is our ancestors notice that every day the moon appears over the eastern horizon at a different time and therefore against a different backdrop of the stars. They also found it takes approximately 27 days for the moon to come back to the same backdrop of the stars. Because of that, they divide the entire ecliptic into 27 segments of 13 and 13 degrees each. Now, it is not enough to divide each segment. You must also recognize that tomorrow. So they looked and said in the first segment, what is the brightest star there? That brightest star, for example, might have been Aldebaran. Aldebaran is an Arabic name. Indian name is Rohini. In some other section of the sky, it might be Regulus. Regulus is the Greek name. Indian name is Maga. In some other place, it might have been Spica. Spica is a Greek name. Indian name is Chitra. In some other place, it might be Zeta Piscium. Zeta Piscium is the star that we call Revati. So they identified the principal brightest stars in every segment of the sky and they gave it the names of one of the wives of the moon. And the, they said that every day the moon would visit one of his wives was an affirmation of the fact that the moon traverses 13 and one third degrees in the sky every night. That's the extended moon in 24 hour period, sorry. It goes 13 and one third degrees. So this is the story behind these nakshatras that you see here, the names of the nakshatras and the names of the wives of the moon. Next, Indians also had the concept of a month. If the full moon happened in the Chitra Nakshatra, that month was called the Chaitra Masa. In some parts of India, they use a full moon as the indicator. In some parts of India, they use a new moon as the indicator, Amavasya. So it is called the Purni Amanta month or the Amanta month, depending on the reference in that part, part of the world. So if somebody says that Rama was born in the Chaitra Masa, which is a statement, two pieces of data jump out at me. One piece of data is if Rama was born in Chaitra Masa, the full moon appeared in the Chitra Nakshatra and by the way, the sun was 180 degrees away in Ashwini Nakshatra. You see that? If the sun was 180 degrees away, that's how it's illuminating a full moon. So I know that the sun, Nakshatra, Surya Nakshatra was Ashwini, Chandra Nakshatra, I know was the Chai, Chitra, Chitra Nakshatra. <coughs> Indian astronomy allows us a precise encoding of information and if you have a key to unlock the wisdom, you can map it to the sky and say precisely what was intended over there. If we dismiss it, for example, the Pavlovian response of most young Indians is, if I say uh, Rohini Nakshatra, the first, I don't believe this. this, is all astrology, this is all horoscope and prediction, all rubbish, I don't believe in these things. This is what has been deep programmed in your mind. You have been deep programmed to reject your past. You have been deep programmed to reject the wisdom of your ancestors. You have been Pavlovian response to give such a kind of a response. This is the tragedy of our country that you have rejected this information. But anyway, I hope that by the end of today's talk, we'll have a healthy appreciation for Indian astronomy. The Indians also divided the sky in 30 degree segments, 12 of them called the Rashi. So we have the Rashi model as well as the Nakshatra model. Here's a listing of all the uh, uh, nakshatras in two of our very ancient books, the Vedanga Jyotisha and the Suti Siddhanta. And this is the principal stars associated with Kritika is Eta Tauri, Rohini is Alpha Tauri, Bradashira Land Orionis, and Mayon is Revati, which is uh, Zeta Piscean. This is a listing. So when the British came to India, we observed the pundits observing the sky. So we asked the pundits, what is that star to you? And the pundits said, what the star is? And the British mapped it to their star system. That's how today we know what are the nakshatra model used in the British king. As analytical people, we'd like to ask a question. How old is the nakshatra model in India? Well, at least as old as Atharva Veda. Atharva Veda 1995, it has a listing of all the nakshatra names. Very, very well developed. It does not show a partial development. It shows a fully developed model leading us to believe it is more ancient than Atharva Veda. There's one more work called Thaikri Samhita, 
and this is this particular verse has once again got a listing of all the nakshatras. So saying at least as old as the Thaitri Samhita, this nakshatra model is that ancient. So this is yesterday's night sky in Hyderabad, uh, January 19th. I wanted to give you a flavor for what your ancestors saw in the sky. Today you go outside in the sky, you see high-rise buildings and light pollution and dust. You can rarely see one or two stars. But your ancestors had a brilliant display of the skies. When they came out, they didn't have TV or uh, YouTube to see in the evening hours. So after dinner, sunset, you come outside and sit in the dinner or the courtyard and you see the brilliant stars in the sky, you observe the motion and so on. What did you see? For example, here is what they might have seen. This particular star in the sky, there's a story over there. The story of a young boy called Druva. Druva had an unhappy family life because his stepmother was treating him pretty, pretty badly. So he was very, very unhappy. He decided to leave home and go and pray to Bhagwan and uh, ask for a happier family life. So he spent many years in meditation and he got enlightenment. Bhagwan came and asked, what do you want? <coughs> this young boy had become so wise after his years of meditation. He no longer wanted when he left home what he didn't want. There. He said, I want nothing. I want nothing. Bhagwan was so pleased. He said, I'm going to make you star in the sky. You'll be immobile in the sky and everybody will go Pradakshina around you, including the Saptarishis will go around you in, 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 in respect of what you do. And that is an affirmation of Dhruva, the polar star. The polar star is there in the night sky in, in, in Hyderabad. It's approximately at this uh, about uh, 15 degrees, 15 degrees from the horizon. So you'll find the pole star over here. It appears that the Earth is rotating about that point. So if Earth is rotating from west to east, so all the heavenly bodies appear to be going from east to west. I live in Houston, where approximately the pole star is 30 degrees in the sky, and it rotates about that point. I also went to Alaska to try and see what does the pole star look like over there. The pole star is around 85 degrees over there in Alaska. So it looks like the Earth is rotating like this. If you go to Jaffna, Jaffna is very close to the equator. It looks like the Earth is lying down and it's rotating about the uh, equator, equatorial point. So this is the axis of rotation. These stars appear to be going in a small circle, bigger circle, bigger circle. You get the idea. So the bigger and bigger circles. So the lines that you're seeing here are the projection of Earth's latitudes and longitudes in the sky. So Earth's latitudes and longitudes projected to the sky become celestial coordinates. So this is the celestial north pole, 90 degrees, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. 0 is very special. Zero is an equator on Earth. In the sky, it becomes a celestial equator. On the day of the equinox, the sun will be exactly on the celestial equator. Then, for a period of time, for example, for six months, the sun appears to be going north and north and north till it reaches 23.3 degrees latitude. Then the sun retracts and goes south, crossing the zero degree line, up to minus 23.3 degrees to the south. Our ancestors call this Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. And they also recorded what was the nakshatra when Uttarayana or Dakshinayana might have happened or the equinox might have happened. Now, the fact that they recorded the nakshatras at the time of Uttarayana and Dakshinayana do not remain true forever. For example, it's not true today because the Earth, in addition to rotation, in addition to revolution around the uh, sun at 365.25 days, it also has one more degree of motion. Where it is pointing to the sky is slowly making a rotation like this in the sky, and it takes 26,700 years to finish one rotation. This is called the precision of equinox. So this precision takes 26,000 years approximately to complete in the sky, and because of that, where it is pointing to is going to change. This is the precision circle. So the point is going to change like this. 15,000 years from now, this star over here, which is called Vega in Greek or Abhijit in India, this has become the polar star. And now, currently, we are at Polaris. That, that's an idea uh, you get from here. Okay? I think as I want to show one more thing. Whenever Indians talked about the nakshatra for the day, it was always when the moon appears over the eastern horizon, what section of sky is it in? Yesterday, in Hyderabad, approximately at uh, uh, 1.42 in the morning, 1.42 in the morning, the moon appeared over the horizon, and when it appeared, it was in the star called Vishaka. So yesterday's nakshatra was Vishaka because the moon appeared over there. 
So today it might be Anuradha because in a 24 hour period it moves. So if you look at a brick panchanga and see what the nakshatra for today, it will be Anuradha because the moon would have appeared in the sectional sky. So this is how your ancestors had a precise way of measuring time, of the passage of time. What is the days, nakshatra, the month, and the Uttarayana where it happened, Dakshinayana where it happened, and so on and so forth. They also knew the extent that the sun goes from Uttarayana to Dakshinayana. How did they know that? Because in your house, if you have an east-facing window, every day at 8 o'clock you see where is the extremal ray of the sun coming, and you make a chalk mark. Next day at 8 o'clock, you make a chalk mark again, where is the sun's rays. If you keep doing this, you'll find the sun is going north and north to northernmost point, then it goes south and south, southernmost point. Our ancestors could measure that, and knew it exactly takes 365.24 days to go from one extreme to the other and back. And because of that, they were able to estimate the solar year as being that size. Even without talking about heliocentrism or any such thing or having telescopes, they estimated just like that. This is the ingenuity of your ancestors. They knew even that, the solar year. All right, that much only for this. I'd like to talk to you about the uh, antiquity of various uh, uh, texts. So first, I'd like to talk to you about the antiquity of the Veda Lithuanian. Veda Lithuanian is one of our early texts. Uh, Jyotisha has got uh, some astronomical observations in the Rig Vedanga Jyotisha, verse 5 and 6. Let me, let me Jyotisha, this one. So, several of the Europeans started uh, studying that. Weber, who was a German, he said it's 500 BCE. William Jones said this time frame. Lokmanya Tilak said this time frame. Dikshit said this time frame. It turns out to be Uttarayana. Vedanga Jyotisha, which is written by Lagada, he said. Uttarayana happened in the Dhanishta Nakshatra. It is no longer true today because we have precision. Remember the same precision that I talked about. So we can go backwards in time and see when was it true that Dhanishta Nakshatra was at the solstice point. This is the solstice point. This is Dhanishta Nakshatra right over here, that latitude. This happened in 1440 BCE. That gives you an idea of the antiquity of the Vedanga Jyotisha. There's one more text that we have called Shatapata Brahma. Shatapata Brahma was written by a rishi called Yajna Valkya. So this is the tragedy of India today. We have so many rishis, but we believe we are mythical people. We don't study about their intellectual contributions. You see the irony of these things happening? Their works have survived today. Their philosophy has survived today. But somehow we have been programmed to think these are all mythical people. They didn't exist. It's a tragedy of our education system that has done this thing to us. Anyway, rishi Yajna Valkya wrote Shatapata Brahma. Shatapata Brahma was a ritual, a Vedic ritual manual for the practitioners. So he said, how do you construct your Vedic altar? How many bricks do you put? How do you put it? How do you do a certain ritual? How do you do a certain thing? How do you find the east direction? Why was east direction important? Because east is an auspicious direction. If my guest is coming from that direction, I can't do namaste over here. It's very, very disrespectful. I need to see where my guest is coming for maximum auspiciousness to do it. Most of the Vedic sacrifices were done for Agni, for Surya. So you need to know where are they coming so that you could face the east direction correctly. Next question. If I ask you where is the east direction, you'll say not a big deal. See where the sun is rising, that's east direction. However, we know Uttarayana up to 23.3 degrees, Dakshinayana up to minus 23.3 degrees. So where is the east direction? Is it here, 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 and here? No, that's not true. Only on the day of the equinox, the sun is pointing to the true east direction. And that is what the Rishi said. Yajnavalkya said, Kritika Nakshatra never moves from the east direction. You may light your Vedic fire under Kritika Nakshatra. This is what he wrote to the practitioner. And it turns out that the heliacal rising of Kritika was true in 2982 BCE. Staggering amount of time. We can work backwards in the tunnel in the software. And uh, here is the horizon, uh, I think the latitude of uh, you know, New Delhi. The latitude of New Delhi have taken and uh, tried to show them. So, Kritika would have, the Vedic practitioner have got up before sunrise when it's still dark, have a ritual bath, come outside, I see Kritika is over there. Half an hour later, the sun comes over the horizon, washes out Kritika, but you have a straight line. I have Kritika there, sun was over there, straight line, I'll construct the altar here, light my fire over here. This is the idea. And so, we know from Shatapata Brahmana, this is the date. There's an ancient epoch encoded in many, many Indian works. For example, Puranas talk about something called Kali Yuga. Aryabhatta, Suri Siddhartha, their effort was epoch. Pulisa Siddhartha, Brahmagupta, Albaruni talk about this. 
temple in Karnataka, I holy, that talks about this. A French guy called Lee Gentle, he was an astronomer who came to India along with the invasion of uh, uh, Tamil Nadu by the French. So he encountered certain astronomical tables which he published as tables of Trivela. He couldn't make sense out of these tables. He sent it out to his buddy. Who was his buddy? Somebody called Cassini. Cassini who lived in Italy. He's a mathematician, astronomer mathematician. He analyzed those tables and said it seems to be referring to something on February 18, 3102 BCE. After he published that, Playfair, Bentley, Colgrove, Burgess, all of them refer to Suri Siddhanta, which also refers to this in the same time frame. It is a rare conjunction of planet, sun, and moon in the Revati nakshatra. I simulated that in the planetarium software. So this is the Revati nakshatra over here. Sun is over here. Moon is over here. Guru is Jupiter. Uh, Shukran is uh, Venus. And you find Shani to Saturn over there, Buddha and Mercury, Mangala is Mars. Everything is clustered in the Revati nakshatra. Such a clustering has not happened for more than 26,000 years. You can crank back in the software and see is there such a thing happening. No, only on February 18, 3102 BC, precisely such a clustering happened. Even today, devout Hindus, when they do their prayers, they recount the beginning of Kali Yuga on this date and the current date. They call out that date and today's date and they do their prayers. So there's a cultural memory of a very, very ancient depot that lives even today among some devout uh, there's a story of Aditi in the Rig Veda. So Aditi, along with the closest Aditi and uh, Rishi Kashyapa, they gave rise to the Adityas, Rudras, and uh, Vasus. We are told that they are the parents of Devas and Daityas. Now the, the Bhagavad Gita says there's a six-month northward course of the sun, Uttrayana, which is the path of the Devas. Dakshinayana is the path of the Daityas. Instinctively, we get the feeling that a mother is not partial to some sons. She's at the equinox point, somewhere middle of the uh, all her sons. She's not partial to so We get that feeling. She is also associated with the Punar Vashu Nakshatra. I'm not going to go into details of why this is true. So, one of the great sons of India, Lokumanya Tilak, he studied this particular verse in the Rig Veda, and he and Professor K.D. Abayankar, they put forth the theory that it refers to an epoch of Aditi in 6000 BCE when there was a vernal equinox at the Punar Vashu Nakshatra. Equinox because of Aditi being at the center point and so on. So we can simulate this and the time frame comes out to be about 6000 BCE. One more story from the Rig Veda, this is the story of Ashwinis. So all of us know the story of Ashwinis. Okay. So all of us know about the story of the Ashwinis. The Ashwinis were mentioned several times in the Rig Veda and so on and so forth. So we know the story of Sanjana. Sanjana gave birth to the Ashwinis through uh, uh, Surya and she couldn't take the heat of the sun. So she left her twins Ashwini in charge of Chaya, her shadow, and she escaped the sun. She abandoned the, her husband, the sun. When the sun was in northern hemisphere, she went to the southernmost point where it is cold, as far away as she could get from the sun. Well, the sun learned about it. He knew that Sanjana took the form of a mare and went to the southernmost regions, and he also went to the southernmost region. Well, if the sun is in the southernmost region, what is there in northern India? It is India, it is the winter solstice. When it's winter solstice, the sun is in the southernmost point. So once again, uh, Lokamanya Silak analyzed this particular phenomena. He also referred to the point that uh, Ashwinis are said to appear at dawn for their share of the Vedic sacrifice. By putting these two features together, they propose that it's referring to a heliacal rising of Ashwini in 7200 BCE. Again, a staggering period of time. Now, uh, there's one more thing in Surya. I'm going to conclude this section very, very soon. So bear with me for two more slides. I'll tell you why I'm telling you all these things. There's a star called Arcturus. Arcturus is a star that Nakshatra Swati. This is mentioned in Surya Siddhanta, recorded in the very recent book, History of Indian Astronomy by Dr. Anil Narayanan. <coughs> if you want to locate Swati in the sky, look for Saptarishi. It points to Swati. Now, Stars also are moving in the sky with respect to us. Normally, every year we see familiar constellation shapes. We think stars don't move. What they do? And Swati is one of the fastest stars in the sky. So it goes through a proper motion. This angle at which it is moving has got a speed of two arc seconds in a year. Swati measurement is there in the Greek records. So if we compare the Greek records, the today's uh, Swati's position is off by one degree. So using this rate of change, we can estimate the Greek records at 1,800 years. Swati is also mentioned in the Surya Siddhanta. 
if you measure the position of swati in suri siddhanta with the position today it is off by a staggering 6 degrees it's off by 6 degrees what does it mean if you take 6 multiply by 60 to convert to minutes multiply by 60 to get to seconds divided by 2 you get 10800 years in other words 8000 bc is when the observation of swati was made in, uh, in this particular moment so why did i talk about all of these things i'd like to use the internal evidence to rebut one of the marxist models which is the aryan invasion theory and how do we do that well one of the godfathers is max muller max muller the, who was motivated entirely with the biblical model he proposed a periodization for the sanskrit text he said aryans came to india in 1500 bc he proposed a chandas period 1200 bc when the earliest books of rig veda were written mantra period remaining books of rig veda brahmana period when aryanic and upanishads were written sutra period when vedangas were written including astronomy well we have just now examined astronomy we have seen that cole brooks date of vedanga jyotish is 1400 bce where is that and where is the sutra period that is all suggested by max muller we saw shatapatha brahmana to 2982 bc kritika does not swerve from the east to that particular one where is that and where is the brahmana period of 800 bc by max muller we saw from rigveda two story of ashwini and adati and this comes out a staggering 7200 bc where is that and where is max muller's chandas period so max muller's works are utter raving so somebody pulls these numbers out of our hand and we can destroy that with the internal evidence of this one he was criticized in europe in a conference somebody came to announce mr max miller is all of indian chronology to be held hostage to the biblical model and he was so furious he wrote an entire book on that you can download this and read it bottom line he said i don't believe in any of indian astronomy i discredit all those sources unreliable and so on and so forth and these views are flaunted even today by some scholars and uh, we honor such a man with a stamp and other things how are we doing and I'm told that I should conclude the talk in the next few minutes. I have a lot more to talk about, but I'm not sure there's enough time to talk about it. I'll talk to you about genetics, where uh, 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 I just perhaps my title. This, this is the conclusion of my genetics slide. The fact that I have very poor confidence in the genetics model going down like this. There are three models in genetics today. One model is the presence or absence of a genetic marker. If I say I have a genetic marker and professor does not have that marker. Then that's a fact. I can't dispute that. The presence or absence is okay. However, if I say in this room, 20% of you carry a certain RNA marker, and therefore I'm saying in all of Hyderabad, which is maybe seven million, eight million people, I carry 20% of them are carrying that. That is a disputable one. That is, I don't agree with that, including direction of genetic flow. If somebody says we have got 30% of RNA from Central Asia, and the all of India carries 40% of that, and so on and so forth. utterly bogus utterly bogus i call the doubt with the studying their models methodology data samples and claims i say the results cannot be global i'm not going to present to you all the mathematics and the bottom line is just because convergence is obtained it does not confer correctness it's like this we are now in this auditorium if you go to your google map and say how do i go to uh, hyderabad airport from here Google map will say you can go by this route, you can go by that route, you can go by this route. This is going to be forty minutes more accident on that road and so on. You are going to privilege one particular road just because you privilege that road does not make it more correct. That road took you forty minutes less, and this road will take you one hour more. But both roads are exactly correct. You just privileged one road and does not make it correct. That is what we are trying to say over here. Just because you got a, a convergence and you took a particular path in your mathematical studies. from that you cannot derive from that to take the parameters and say that this is the percentage of rna that is the percentage of this marker and so on it's only a consequence of the path to which you converged and not the global result anyway many many problems over there i want to show the absurdity of the studies 2006 <coughs> they say the y haplo groups in india l rna j2 and h marker these are the kind of distributions in another result in 2018 the same north india east india west india south india these percentages have changed enormously so looking at these two things i ask in a span of 10 years what changed why did the percentage of markers change if you are a thinking person you say red flag has gone up red flag says either your data is screwed up or the methods are screwed up or maybe the conclusions are screwed up assumptions are wrong model is wrong or the methods are wrong some problem is there that you cannot take both of them in total saying they are both right that's one example multiple people 
since you asked them from Bashu 2003 to Thangaraj of uh, CCMB in Hyderabad in 2010, where did Abane originate? Some people say Central Asia, Southern Asia, North India, South India, so on and so forth. So even among scholars, there's no consensus. Where did this marker called Arvan A that is so critical for genetic Indian identity, where did it originate? Is it Central Asia or is it in India? It is not a simple question. If you go to the superstar professor called David Reich, he says Central Asians and Indians are related through the Arvan A Z93 marker and is a common recent ancestor going back 4,000 years. That is his thesis. However, if you go to Professor Lukard, he says Central Asians and Indians related to Arvan A Z93 common ancestor 15,000 years ago. So two studies that give you diametrically opposite results. And what do people do? They privilege the man's pedigree. The pedigree is this gentleman is from the Harvard Medical School. And because he's from Harvard Medical School, he privileged the pedigree and says this is what is probably like. And here you have people like Tony Joseph run off and write how did caste system originate, what is the the story of us as a people, utterly bogus based on bogus studies over here. 2018, uh, David Reese's group said that in 7000 BC, the people who came, Iranian pastoral farmers came to India, settled North, uh, ancestral South Indians, 4000 BC, years ago, uh, Aryan invasion and so on and so forth. This is their model. When they said that, I said, if you cannot show me the evidence of internal evidence of Indian texts, we have a problem over here. I said there's a Vedas, Puranas talk about Anu and Druhyu who migrate out of India. Evidence for that is Bhagavad Purana, Vishnu Purana, Vayu Purana, Pramanda Purana, Matsya Purana, Rig Veda. All of these verses are talking about those people who migrate out of India. Are they idiots? Are these references to be thrown out? For what reason? Just because Max Miller came and said it's unreliable? Am I going to chuck out all these citations that I have? So I said if your genetic studies does not show even a little sliver of information going out of India, a big red flag has gone for me. I said that the minute the paper was published in my public talks, I said, if you take a piece, few pieces of data out of your studies and put some other data, will you converge to the same result as you did before? That's called sensitivity analysis. Any decent researcher will do that. You'll try to see how sensitive is my result to the data that I'm operating on. If I take a few pieces of data out, put something else, will I get a different answer? In such a case, I'm strongly dependent on these few data points. I suggested doing that at that time. That's exactly what they did in 2019, September 2019. They discovered about 11 skeletons in Iran in a place. They included that in the study. The minute they did that, they retracted on the earlier model. They said this 7000 BC Iranian pastoral farmers coming to India is not true because the model has converged to a different answer. You understand what I'm saying? And But they held on to this Aryan invasion coming 4000 years ago in India. In India, you had Neeraj Rai, Vasant Sindhi, and others who talked essentially the same thing, who talked about the Indus Valley climb, which had some amount of Andamanis hunter, hunter gatherers. You had to go back to 10,000 BC for a common link, along with Iranian hunter gatherers, herders, and so on and so forth. So, this is the uh, bottom line of this is I say results in genetics cannot be globalized. I have a healthy disrespect for this mechanisms over here. I say that. Results must be very, very narrow and clear. You have to say that in the context of the data I've selected, maybe 15,000 samples, in the context of the methods I've taken, in the context of the initialization I've done, make a modest proposal saying this is what I've done. If you have a bombastic claim saying that I have proven Aryan invasion theory, excuse me, you must be prepared for strong criticism and ridicule with this. That this is not valid. So that is the bottom line of this. So I think at this point I will uh, probably uh, I don't know. I don't, see, I don't see my host over here. How am I doing on the time? Am I okay? Can I go on or should I stop? <laughs> I can tell my name in five minutes. <laughs> oh, so let, let me try to wind up. Uh, so there is a lot of evidence that does not fit the RN invasion theory. One of the biggest one is Saraswati. The Saraswati River is something that the NCRT textbooks are scared to mention. Go and look in the NCRT textbooks. They don't mention Saraswati River by name. They talk about a drying up of a river. They don't tell by name what it is because they call it a mythological river. Here is a paper that came out in 2019, uh, uh, November 2019, Anirban Chatterjee. They say the mica gray sand is typical of glacial fed higher Himalayan rivers. We found those layers three to 10 meters below the surface, up to 300 kilometers up to the Pakistan border. Powerful indication of a river in the past. So there's no question about Saraswati River existing. And the fact that it dried up in the 1900 BCE. 
Now, why is this important? Because the Rig Veda is talking about the powerful Saraswati River. It's mentioning that several times in Rig Veda, flowing from the Himalayas down to the ocean. Now, if the Chandas period is 1200 BCE and they wrote Rig Veda after coming to India, how could they have talked about a mighty river that's already gone underground, already dried up in 1900 BCE? So very, very strong rebuttal just by the presence of Saraswati disregards that. This uh, Dr. B.B. Love, he worked for years on the Harappa model and so on and so forth. End of his career, he rejected the so-called periodization of Harappa and uh, uh, Vedic ideas. He said that there is evidence of continuity of civilization, the Pashupati sea, Swastika sea, terracotta figurines of women that show the Sindur symbol. Even today in India, several married women wear the Sindur symbol. That is their Harappa. What is it doing in Harappa? There's a Vedic uh, symbol over there. Here's a symbol of a terracotta figurine showing Namaste. Namaste is deeply Vedantic. It says, Narayana in me is bowing to the Narayana in you. That is a Vedantic concept. What is that doing in Harappa in such an early period of time? What is over there? Uh, S.R. Rao found Shivalinga in Kalibanga and several yoga asana terracotta figurines have been found in uh, these places. Again, yoga is integral to Hinduism. What is it doing in Harappa? So he points out in the continuity of civilization. Iron is found in Telangana. If I'm not mistaken, in the University of Hyderabad uh, premises, it has been found. Professor K.P. Rao, who found these kind of things. We are told by, for example, these gentlemen, Aryans brought Iron Age to India, 1500 BCE. But in Telangana, we found knives, blades, and I heard yesterday there were even two foundries they found. Two foundries where uh, swords and other things are made, going back, tested in Hyderabad in this lab, optical simulated luminescence, up to 2400 BCE. This is the strong rebuttal for iron. Everybody in India knows about Sanali by now. We know that there are pit burials there, found the chariots over there in Uttar Pradesh. I strongly recommend you search for a, a video called Warriors of Sanawli on YouTube. So the chief architect, uh, archaeologist over here, he gave an interview in that Warriors of Sanawli where he declares that these are horse-bound chariots. He even found evidence of horse whip there. Why is that important? Because Michael Witzel came out and published a report saying that these were not horse-bound chariots. That these are bullock carts or donkey carts and things of that nature. But then the lead archaeologist who got access to data has clearly come out in this Warriors of Sanawli YouTube video calling these as uh, horse-bound chariots. Here's the paper that came out in May 2018 that talks about uh, paddy cultivation in Ganga Plain, Lahura Deva, uh, in 9,000 years ago. Important because it invalidates the claim that agriculture came to India via Turkey. It invalidates a particular claim. This is a paper that came out in 2007, Genome Biology. The researchers over here wanted to find where is the ancestor of the common housewives. Okay. To their surprise, they found that the ancestor of common house mice was in India. From India, it went to Madagascar, to Northern Africa, to uh, Europe, to Central Asia, to China, and other places. They also addressed the question of how old is this ancestor of the common house mice? They found this 12,000 years ago. Very, very important because today we know that in India, if you store paddy in a storeroom, what is going to come? Mice are going to come. And as paddy is exported to the rest of the world, who goes along? The mice go along. So very, very powerful to take this paper and this paper. It looks like your paddy was invented in India and spread out of India going to the rest. This is a paper that came out in uh, Science in uh, July 2019. It's a very, very familiar Zebo. Zebo is a cattle in India that's very, very important because it is drought resistant. It has been adapted to India's arid conditions. Very, very useful. This paper found they appeared suddenly in Mitanni Hittite lands in 2200 BCE as a consequence of around a 200 year drought that was there in India. It appears that the Indian cattle, suddenly the number of artifacts they went, well, uh, found went up 4000 years ago. They say it came from the Indus Valley civilization and talking about the outward migration of India that has caused this kind of thing. So I think I'll end over there. I have a lot of uh, slides still that talk about the Indian knowledge system. A lot to talk about, that, especially given that uh, today's Indians seem to think that the British brought a rational way of thinking to the superstitious land. We were people drilled in superstitions and so on. The British brought a rational way of thinking to us. And these people are completely disconnected from the knowledge systems of the past. Maybe I'll just take two more slides and I'll wind up after that. Here's an example. If you were to take uh, the ancient philosophical systems of India, Nyaya 
Rishi Yakshipal the Gautama, who said, for example, all knowledge is not intrinsically valid. Most knowledge is not valid unless proven. Truth exists whether we human beings know it or not. It's profound statements from Rishi, who we don't even know started, existed, right? We say he's a mythical figure. <laughs> then we have uh, Vaisheshika, Rishi Kanada, work in perceptual inference, Sankhya, Rishi Kapila, systematic enumeration, rational examination, Purva Mimamsa, Kumari Butter, reflection, consideration, profound thought, investigation, examination, discussion, and Uttra Mimamsa Vedanta. I give these examples to show that even today as a scientist, if I were to encounter a certain situation, the first thing I do is a systematic enumeration of everything I know in that case. I try to do a literature survey. I try to study what do I know about this, all the facts. Then I go through a process of rational examination. Then I go through a process of reflection, consideration, thought, investigation, the lab, maybe examination, discussion with friends, and so on and so forth. Then I get some insight and say, aha, that is what this is all about. So even today as a scientist, I'm using the methods of our ancestors, but we are very, very quick to say the British are the ones who taught us this rational way of thinking. Here is the means for knowledge, pramana. In India, we had perception, inference, comparison, postulation, negative proof, as well as shakta pramana. Today, if somebody's writing their PhD thesis, let's say there's a guy who's writing his uh, PhD thesis in economics. What do you do? You go to the library. You take all the journals, the recent journals, you find a professor in MIT or some economic school, London School of Economics, who's published a theorem. And that theorem is very, very important for me, for my thesis. So I say, on the Shabda Pramana of that particular professor, reference number one, reference number two, I'm going to write this theorem using this result, proving this additional result. That's what we're doing today as scholars, right? We use the authority of somebody who came above us, who's respected in society, who got his papers published in a prestigious journal, and we say, because he's right, and therefore I think I am also right. So that is the authority with which we write today. But in ancient India, for example, Chalvakas, Chalvakas were the 80s in India. They said only perception matters. The Vedas don't matter. If I can see it, it's real. Otherwise, it's not real. The Buddhists said, I only perception and inference matters to reflect what Gautama Buddha did. Right? He went through a process of trials, tribulations, and basically his perception and inference gave to what he said is truth. Similarly, whether it is Samkhya, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Jainism, it only differs, each Sampradaya only differs from what are the valid means of knowledge admitted. By the time we come to Advaita, it's taking almost the same thing. Okay, so I'll jump from that. I wanted to talk to you about roots of medicine, a whole lot of information, roots of mathematics, roots of music, roots of astronomy, roots of modern systems. I wanted to show you knowledge transmission from India. There are certain people often tell me, if you say knowledge went from India, India was the Vishwa Guru, where is the proof for that? Who are the people who took this knowledge? What is the route it went by? Uh, in my research, I've got up to six routes for knowledge transmission. No time to read about it. There's one such route. Second one, the Telusid Empire that caused a conduit, but, and the Silk Route, where the Boer manuscript was found. <coughs> then the Periplus of Eritrean Sea, the road to Spain, Muslim Spain, Indian knowledge was injected in these areas. Church transmissions and uh, the colonial transmissions. I have a paper on this, you might want to read it in Dave's Dallas. So, my final point, people say that the Indian civilization, is it recent or ancient? I'll end with this last one. So, I'm not going to read all these things. If you take a look at the Shanti Mantras in several of our texts, several of the Upanishads, several of the Rig Vedas, you don't find people who are saying, God killed my enemies, God commanded me to destroy that person, make me rich, make everybody else poor, kill my enemies, destroy. You don't find that. You find people who have transcended their narrow requirements and say, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramaya. Basically meaning that, let the whole world prosper, let everybody be healthy, let everybody come up. Not only people and living things, animate as well as inanimate objects. They had a healthy respect for the cosmos, for nature, and everything. You find that whether you look at these works or you look at Prashna Upanishads, you find literary evidence of high thinking all over these places. So my bottom line, very deep knowledge uh, systems in India, high accomplishment in a wide range of fields, mathematics, and so on and so forth, evidence of highly cultured people from very ancient times, pan-India evidence of cultural similarity, evidence of knowledge transmission, Archaeology collaborates antiquity, sea, and astronomy. 20 years ago, if I had gone and said, Aditi is referring to 7200 BC, people laugh at me and say, what rubbish. But today in India, you go to Birara, you're finding artifacts from 9,000 years ago. Archaeology has come within the range of what is predicted in astronomy today in India. That is the bottom line. Antiquity plus knowledge systems plus transmission plus high thinking, I'm claiming is evidence of 
high civilization. We started out with these Marxist assertions, and I'd like to cut out every one of them and show that an evidence-based analysis uh, shows uh, these things. And, uh, Marxist assertions are utterly bogus. Utterly bogus. So it calls for an urgent need to revise our textbooks and our uh, thinking by an evidence-based narration. Not just because I'm a jingoistic chap standing here and talking to you, but using the published literature and works over here, we can try and put forth uh, bold new uh, theories. Thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Thank you.